should be fine. Thank you all for joining. My name is Kate Robertson. I'm the president-elect for the ASCG. Um, it's great to see so many smiling black boxes with names here. Uh, so today we have Daniel Blatter from Lamont Delby Earth Observatory, Columbia University, speaking with us. Um, but before we jump into that, um, I wanted to uh, mention a few housekeeping items. So I'd like to start by acknowledging our corporate sponsors, our corporate members. So um, our corporate plus members, High Size and Bell Size, and our corporate members, Archimedes Financial Planning, Instrumentation, GDD Inc, Santos, SA Exploration and Southern Geoscience Consultants. <clears throat> so these uh, corporate members um, make a great contribution to the society with uh, financial donations and support for the ASCG and the Research Foundation. So our Research Foundation uh, sponsors geophysics students, uh, honours, masters, PhD students uh, to help them with their projects. Um, so thank you to these members. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge our branch sponsors. So for the South Australian Northern Territory branch, New South Wales and Western Australia branches, we've got um, a variety of very generous companies who have donated uh, to our branches and helped to enable uh, our branch events to take place. And so just a, um, a few Zoom notes. So um, when you joined the meeting, your, your cameras would all be turned off and your microphones would all be muted. Um, if you can just uh, make sure you keep it like that throughout the meeting just to avoid any distractions. Um, and so you can see on this slide here where the unmute button, where the mute and start video, this is what it'll look like when your video and your microphone are both turned off. Um, also, if you have a question, you can ask these throughout. We'll do questions at the end of the talk, um, but you can ask them anytime throughout or at the end using the chat function, which should be at the bottom of your screen um, and circled in red on this uh, slide here. Uh, we also have some, just wanted to advertise the upcoming webinars that we have. Um, so on the 26th of May, we'll have uh, Dr. Peter Betts from Monash University. We'll be talking on the topic of uh, crustal architecture of mineral systems using gravity and magnetics. And the ASCG president, uh, David Annettes uh, from CSIRO on the 7th of July, who will be talking about 10 years in the wild, the P223 experiment. And if you have any suggestions for any future webinars, please don't hesitate to let us know. We're grateful for uh, anyone who's uh, willing to share their work. Um, and I just wanted to highlight uh, the benefits of being an ASEC member. So um, there's many benefits available. So you get access to a journal, the ASCG's technical journal, uh, Exploration Geophysics, um, along with a preview, a magazine, um, reduced entry to AEGC conferences, uh, free entry to local branch events, um, access to job advertisements, discounted wine offers, uh, social events from, uh, yeah, from the wine events to golf events to Melbourne Cup, um, and then a lot of networking opportunities, which is uh, arguably one of the best benefits um, of joining the ASCG. Uh, we also provide research funding through the ASCG Research Foundation to geophysics students and also travel scholarships through the ASCG um, to attend conferences, uh, field work, etc. And if you're a student, uh, membership is free and half price for retirees and recent graduates with terms and conditions on the ASCG website. So we'd love to see um, some new members. Uh, and just lastly, uh, before I pass over to Daniel, uh, we uh, encourage you to stay in touch with what's happening with the ASCG. We're very active on social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, subscribe to our YouTube channel um, and always um, find our upcoming events on the ASCG website. 
Um, and so with that, I will uh, pass over the, um, the video to Daniel. So Daniel Blatter from Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, Columbia University. Um, he's a doctoral candidate in geophysics at Lamont, at Lamont Doherty. Uh, his research interests include marine electromagnetic imaging, Bayesian inversion algorithms, quantitative uncertainty estimation, lithosphere, asthenosphere, boundary geodynamics, and more. He hopes to defend his thesis in the summer, the US summer that is, and will be the John W. Miles postdoctoral scholar in computational and theoretical geophysics at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, UC San Diego, starting in the fall of 2020. So with that, I'll turn my video off and pass over to Daniel. So thanks, Dan. All right, thanks, Kate. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, hopefully, everybody can now see my screen and see the uh, the presentation. I've never done a, a webinar via Zoom before, so this is a, a new experience for me. Thanks for the opportunity, and good morning. It's evening in Salt Lake here, but I have it on good authority that uh, it's morning in Australia, so good morning. My talk today is going to be on constraining the resistivity of pore fluids in the crust with Bayesian joint inversion of MT and surface toad CSEM data. I want to acknowledge my collaborators up front. Um, they're all wonderful scientists. My uh, PhD advisor, Kerry Key at uh, Lamont Doherty. Anandarup Ray, who's a brilliant scientist uh, now at Geoscience Australia, actually. Uh, Rob Evans over at Woods Hole and Chloe Gustafson, who's also at uh, Columbia. She's one of my um, lab mates, a fellow PhD student. Uh, so the outline of my talk today is as follows. I'll first give you an overview of uh, Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or which is the Bayesian inversion algorithm that I use. Um, then second, I'll jump into joint Bayesian inversion of CSCM and MT data. Uh, this is going to we'll show you a little toy synthetic problem and then some field data. And then finally, I'm going to be talking about what you can do with joint Bayesian inversion or Bayesian inversion in general beyond um, just inverting for the, the model parameters that you're inverting for. Namely, you can propagate Bayesian-derived uncertainties into related um, physical parameters. All right, first, an overview of MCMC. I guess top of the order, we first need to talk about the physical property that we're inverting for, namely subsurface electrical resistivity. So this is an interesting Earth property for a number of reasons. Um, one reason is that it spans a massive range of resistivity values, uh, several orders of magnitude, all the way from uh, 0.10 ohm meters, um, basaltic, pure basaltic melt has a resistivity around 0.1 meter, ohm meters, seawater has a resistivity about 0.3, all the way up to uh, peridotite or gabbro, which could have resistivities up in several thousands of ohm meters. And ice can actually have a resistivity above 10,000 ohm meters. So it spans a wide dynamic range, but it also tells you a lot about what's going on in the Earth, particularly it tells you about fluids. So um, pure basaltic melt is down on the order of about 0.1 ohm meters, but partial melts, depending on how much melts you have, could span a significant range from one ohm meter all the way to 100 ohm meters. Similarly, um, porous sediments, depending on the salinity of the pore fluids or the conductivity of the pore fluids, could have a resistivity spanning um, everywhere from one ohm meter up to beyond 10 ohm meters. So that in order to infer about the subsurface's electrical resistivity, we need to collect some field data. So the data we're going to be inverting here in this talk is surface toad CSEM data and MT data. Here CSEM stands for controlled source electromagnetic and MT stands for magnetotelluric. So the CSEM method is, as it, the name implies, um, a controlled source method. So we have an artificial source of electric fields. We uh, tow a 300 meter long dipole behind a ship. The electric field produced by this is shown sort of in a little inset on the left. And we flip the polarity of this field um, over time periodically. And the, the changing electromagnetic fields that this produces in the nearby um, 
ocean and subsurface sediments are then picked up by a, an array of four electric field receivers towed behind uh, the transmitter. CSEM is primarily sensitive to resistive structures. The electric fields attenuate less rapidly and the, have a faster phase velocity in resistors. So that the response of the resistors is um, going to be dominating the fields you pick up at the um, receivers. Magnetotelluric data, on the other hand, is a passive method. It measures natural variations in the Earth's field and the induced secondary fields caused by those variations. And as a result, it's going to be primarily sensitive to conductive structures. We measure the, the MT fields on these um, ocean bottom receivers. And like I said, it's going to be sensitive to parts of the subsurface where currents can be generated, so the more conductive parts of the subsurface. So this information is all very useful. Um, but we can't directly infer the subsurface electroresistivity from the data itself just by looking at the raw data. So we need to call upon a, a suite of techniques known as inverse methods. So um, inverse theory, in case it's been a while since you've had a rundown of it or if you never had a chance to really study it, is um, a method for inferring model parameters from measured geophysical data. And it starts by modeling the subsurface. So for instance, this 1D stack of layers, each of which has a constant resistivity and a thickness. Uh, the modeling in this um, study was all done using 1D modeling. So um, each of these layers, again, has a constant resistivity and a thickness. If I stack all of these parameters up into a vector, a ve I call that vector M, this vector now represents my understanding of the subsurface. It's my model of the Earth. The next piece I need to do inverse theory is I need forward modeling. So I need a function f, which is nonlinear, which takes as input my model of the subsurface m and produces as output my modeled geophysical observations. In other words, the data I would measure if I conducted the experiment described by my modeling function f and if m was an accurate representation of the subsurface. Now, m and d are both uh, vectors, and so they live in vector spaces. We'll call the, the vector space that m lives in the model space. It has dimensionality equal to the number of model parameters. Um, and then D also lives in a vector space. We'll call it the data space. It has dimensionality equal to the number of data that I'm uh, inverting. And what F allows me to do is take a point in model space, a particular model, and map it to a point in data space, a particular data set. But of course, what I really want is the ability to take my data set that I've collected out in the field and uh, deduce the model that gave rise to it. Essentially, I want the answer to the inverse problem. The difficulty I immediately run into, though, is called non-uniqueness. Basically, it's that there are any number of models that can satisfy any given data set. And part of the reason is as follows. Here's my model space and my data space again. And there's my lonely point in data space, the, the field data set that I collected. But in reality, there's actually an entire region of data space compatible with that data set due to my measurement error, my measurement uncertainty. So from a statistical perspective, at least, any data point within, in, sorry, any uh, data set, any point in data space within this sort of region of the measured data set is compatible with it. And that means that there are any number of models that could reasonably land within this space. But of course, these aren't actual discrete points in model space. These are whole regions of model space that then map to this region in data space compatible with my data set. And for me, the whole point of inverse theory is to try to discover and characterize these regions of model space that are compatible with my measured field data for the purpose of understanding my uncertainties in the inverted model parameters. How well can I know the subsurface given the data I've measured? And the upshot is that there may be a lot of models, in fact, probably an infinite number of models that can explain my data adequately well. So how do we tackle this problem from a Bayesian perspective? Well, first, from uh, using a standard sort of deterministic gradient-based methods, we tackle this problem by defining an objective function, which I will call phi, and this a combination of data fit and model regularization. And I then try to find a minimizer of this function. So the sort of analogy is this figure off to the right where I start at one of these black points and I descend these you know, contours of my function phi to try to find a minimizer of that function, one of the red points. 
but this doesn't really capture all the non-uniqueness I showed you on the previous slide. So what Bayesian inversion tries to do instead is it says, don't find me one model to rule them all, so to speak. Find me the distribution of probability density for every model in model space, conditional on the data that I've measured. So in the little plot on the right, the analogy here is that I'm not trying to find one minimizer or maximizer of a function. I'm trying to sample that function according to its probability density. I'm trying to find all of the models that can fit my data adequately well. How does this work? Well, it relies on Bayes' rule. It's why it's called Bayesian inversion. And Bayes' rule is very crucial, but also very simple. And here we're going to sort of call upon the idea of information theory to try and understand, give, give you an intuitive sense of how Bayesian inversion works. The piece on the right is called the prior. It's a probability density function of all your model parameters that represents what you think you already know about the subsurface, what you already know about your subsurface uh, model parameters. In all of the work I'm gonna show you today, the prior we use is uniform between given bounds, which basically means that we don't know what the subsurface resistivity is at any given location or depth in the subsurface, other than that it must exist between um, two end members that we choose. And we choose those end members to be sufficiently wide as not to sort of bias the inversion, as to allow anything that we think could be physically reasonable in the, given the particular geology of where we collected our data. The second term is called the likelihood. It's a measure of the data fit. And essentially the way to think of it is it's the probability that my measured data and my model data differ only due to random noise, not because my model is incorrect. So the larger the likelihood, um, the better your data fit, essentially. Or the better the data fit, the larger the likelihood. And finally, um, we use a e to the minus chi squared by two, which is essentially a least squares form of data fitting. And finally, the posterior, this is the thing we're looking for. It's the holy grail. It's the probability of a model given the data I've measured, and it's proportional to the product of the likelihood and the prior. So if you think of it in terms of information, the prior represents information you have independent of your data. And then the likelihood comes in and adds information, modifies the prior to produce the posterior. So anywhere the posterior looks different than the prior, you know that the data is sort of weighing in and um, modifying your prior knowledge to give you an a posteriori um, estimate of probability. And anywhere the posterior looks just like the prior, looks uniform, that means that the data isn't really having anything to say about that particular model parameter. Now, how do we find the posterior in a practical sense? Well, we draw many, many samples from it. And then from those samples, we build um, histograms, which when properly normalized, represent bits of the distribution itself. But how do you draw samples from a distribution who's, you know, who, that you do not know and that doesn't actually possess a closed form analytical you know, solution that you can write down on paper? Well, there actually are a number of clever ways of doing this. And the one that I use in my research group uses is called Transdimensional Markov Chain Monte Carlo. It's kind of a mouthful. You can just think of it as a means of drawing samples from the posterior, or if you like, it's a guided random walk through the model space, guided by the data, of course. And the final output of MCMC, and this is sort of the key, is an ensemble or collection of models that represent samples drawn from the posterior and from which statistical information about your model parameters can be inferred. All right, so how does MCMC work? Let's peek under the hood just a little bit. MCMC stands for Markov Chain Monte Carlo. And a Markov chain is just a chain of models, a sequence of models that grows by perturbing the last model in the chain in some way, and then either accepting or rejecting that perturbed model. So let's say this is my, the nth model in my chain, here where I say warmer colors represent more resistive models and cooler colors represent um, more uh, conductive layers. The version of MCMC that I use allows you to perturb the last model in the chain in one of four ways. I can either add an interface to it and adding a uh, an associated layer, or I can delete an interface and delete an associated layer, or I can move an interface from where it currently is to a new location, or I can leave all the interfaces where they are and just change the layer resistivities. So doing one of, choosing one of these, let's say we add an interface, we can produce what's called a proposal model. 
this proposal model then we take and compute its posterior probability, which I can do because I can compute the misfit. I can uh, do forward modeling to compute my model data, compute the misfit with the measured data, and therefore use the likelihood function to compute its value. I can also compute the value of the prior because I choose the, the, the prior distribution and their product is proportional to the posterior. So I compute the posterior probability of mprop and I compare it to the posterior probability of the nth model that it was generated from. If it's greater than I accept mprop, because I'm happy, I'm moving towards models that fit the data better and that fit my prior assumptions better, and it becomes the n plus first model in the chain. If it's less probable, I can still accept it because again, my goal is not, I don't want a deterministic algorithm that just produces the most probable model. I want to sample all of the models that fit the data adequately well, that have a, a reasonably high posterior probability. So I can still accept it, but only with probability alpha, where alpha is given by the ratio of the posterior probabilities of mprop and then n. And here, um, if I accept it, it becomes the n plus first model as before. If I reject it, then the nth model becomes the n plus first model. And I repeat the algorithm over and over again, many hundreds of thousands of times. And the idea is that um, by the time I've run this for a very long time, by the time my markup chain is very, very long, the models that appear in the chain do so in proportion to their posterior probability or rather um, value ranges of particular model parameters will appear in the Markov chain in proportion to their probability, their posterior probability density. All right, that's enough for the theory. Um, let's look at this in practice. But before we do, let's talk about joint inversion in a Bayesian framework. What does that look like? Well, it's actually extremely simple. The only part on the right-hand side of this relationship of Bayes' rule that includes the data is the likelihood. So let's expand that out just a little bit. That exponent looks a little bit heinous, but it's actually not so bad. It's just these squares. And that matrix C sub D is my um, data error covariance matrix. Um, in this case, we assume that our data errors are uncorrelated. So it's just a diagonal matrix. Now, it's interesting to note that Bayes' rule doesn't know anything about data type. So long as all of your data types, all your data sets are inferring the, on the same physical parameters, in this case, electroresistivity, Bayes' rule knows nothing about data type. All it knows is the size of the data error relative to your model data and the measured data. So if you want to add a new data set, just stack it onto the end and expand your model vector, or sorry, your data vector, and away you go. It's no more complicated than that. So really joint Bayesian inversion is extremely simple, though I will say here that it is very important that you get your data errors right. Because if you misestimate them, then that can definitely infer, it will give you, it will definitely affect the posterior, let's put it that way. Because again, um, as I showed you earlier, the, the regions of model space compatible with your data is very much a function of the size of that target that they're shooting for. And that's a function of your data error. So it's very important to get that right. So why do joint inversion at all? Um, I, there's a little cartoon that maybe sort of illustrates the point. Let's say we just have two model parameters, M1 and M2. And let's say we collect the data. And this blue region is the combination of parameters M1 and M2 that can satisfy data set one. And let's say that this salmon colored region is the combination of model parameters that can satisfy data set two. And it stands to reason that if I invert both data sets jointly, the combination of model parameters that can satisfy them both at the same time is this overlapping region. And because the two data sets contain complementary information about the subsurface, indicated by their differing um, trade-off curves or, or regions, the overlapping region in the center is actually significantly smaller than either of the two original regions. And this is sort of why you do joint inversion, to constrain the model parameters um, that can fit your data. Gradient-based inversion takes advantage of this, of course, but it doesn't allow you to really visualize these two spaces because you're just finding a minimizer of your objective function, whereas Bayesian inversion is actually sampling from these two regions. So you should be able, for a simple toy problem at least, to actually plot up the sort of the region. If you plot all the models that in your model ensemble, you should be able to, they should sort of map out these regions. And I always wanted to see how that worked in practice, see if Bayesian inversion could visualize for you the virtues of joint inversion. So what I did is I came up with this really simple toy problem. Um, in this problem, all of the layer interfaces are fixed and the water column resistivity is also fixed. So the only thing I'm inverting for 
are the four resistivities, row one through row four. The upper layer is sort of like a moderate resistivity on consolidated sediments. The second layer represents a more um, resistive freshwater aquifer analog. The next layer down is more conductive. It represents sort of a brine layer. And then there's a resistive basement beneath that. I generated synthetic data by generating the model responses for MT and CSEM from this particular model and then adding some random noise. The uh, synthetic data are off to the right. And then I inverted those data using my TransD MCMC algorithm. I inverted the MT data by themselves, the CSEM, CSEM data by themselves, and then I inverted both data sets together. And again, the point is to plot pairs of these model parameters, like row one versus row two, for instance, or row one versus row three, for each of these mo three model ensembles to see which re sort of um, what regions of model space they trace out, what regions of model space are, are compatible with each data set individually and together. And here's an example of that. So this is um, row one, that sort of upper layer of moderate resistivity plotted against row two, the freshwater aquifer layer. The green points are um, pairs of you know, resistivities, row one comma row two, taken from the MT only model ensemble. And the orange points represent models taken at random from the CSEM only model ensemble. And the blue points represent models taken from the joint model ensemble. The true value is sort of that dark circle in the center and the dashed line is just outlining or delineating the region of the compatible with the joint data set. There are a number of interesting takeaways from this image. The first is that MT and CSCM data really do contain complementary or different information about the subsurface. For example, the MT data, the green cloud, doesn't really know how to pin down very well row two. It doesn't know the value of row two very well, but it does know the value of row one quite accurately. The CSEM data, on the other hand, don't know the value of row one very well, but they can pin down the value of row two. And this sort of corroborates what we thought before, that CSEM is more sensitive to resistors, um, namely row two, and MT is more sensitive to conductors, or row one. And then the power of joint inversion becomes obvious when you realize that the region of, of model space compatible with the joint data set is actually smaller than the intersection of the two individual regions, which is quite cool. We did this for all of the possible pairs of, of parameters in this toy problem and plotted them sort of in the form of a covariance matrix with the variances along the diagonal and the covariances on the off diagonals. It's sort of fun to look at how well each of these data sets can constrain each of these model parameters individually and then together. And for me, this sort of illustrates the beauty of Bayesian inversion is it doesn't just give you one model that fits the data, it gives you a sense of the range of models that can fit your data. All right, enough for uh, synthetic inversion. Let's invert some real data. This is the survey map for a joint CSEM MT survey most of the United States of New Jersey. The goal was to image a freshwater aquifer in the continental shelf. The blue triangles represent MT sites. The white lines represent uh, where we collected CSEM data. And the green circles are well locations that we made sure that our survey was co-located with. And more on those later. On the next slide, oh, there's Lamont Doherty, uh, where I uh, used to live and work. I fled New York City due to coronavirus a, a few weeks ago. On the next slide, I'm going to show you a 2D gradient-based inversion result, um, joint inversion result of the MT and CSEM data of this main line done by Chloe Gustafson. And here it is. Uh, note the vertical exaggeration. Uh, there's about one kilometer on the y-axis and about 150 kilometers on the x-axis. So this really is a pretty 1D sort of geology where you have this moderate resistivity sort of background. And then at about 200 meters depth, you have this freshwater aquifer out to about 80 kilometers distance from the shore. And then at greater depths, around 600 meters or so, you have this saline or briny, more conductive layer coming in. And what I'm going to show you on the next slide is um, Bayesian inversions. So basically the, the posterior probability density function from just the MT data, from just the CSEM data, and then from the joint data set. All right, here they are. If you haven't seen these plots before, it can be a little bit hard to navigate, so let me walk you through it. Um, these are plots of the posterior probability density function for electrical resistivity 
as a function of depth in the subsurface. So for each of these plots, we have on the y-axis depth in meters, on the x-axis electroresistivity in log units, and um, on the left we have panel A, the result for just CSEM only, and the panel B, MT only, and C, the joint model ensemble. Um, the warmer colors in each plot represent regions of higher probability, and the cooler colors represent regions of lower probability. These figures are meant to be read um, left to right at each depth. So at each depth, you're looking at a marginal probability density function, which, so the, the probability density sums to one as you go from left to right across the figure, across each plot at each depth. The red lines represent the fifth and 95th percentiles from left to right, respectively. And then the white line represents um, a 1D profile through Chloe Gustafson's 2D gradient-based inversions. The joint inversion you saw on the previous slide and then the other two I didn't show. There are a number of interesting points to sort of take away from this slide. Uh, one, I guess the first is that the gradient-based inversions really are doing a great job of providing you a, a model estimate that fits the data pretty well, a pretty good model estimate. They all fall within the 90% 90, 90 credible interval between those two red lines at almost every depth all the way down the model. Um, but what they don't give you is a sense of how confident you should be or what the uncertainty around that estimated resistivity is at each depth. So take, for example, in panel B, the MT only model ensemble. If you take, if you look at about 100 meters depth, the estimate of resistivity is around, I don't know, two or three ohm meters. But what you don't know from the gradient based inversion alone is that that is actually at the conductive end of what is allowed by the data. The MT data is pretty sure that the earth can't be more conductive than that, but it could be plenty more resistive and it, it, it just sort of doesn't, can't really tell how resistive. It just knows it can't be more conductive than that. But you don't get that information without um, Bayesian inversion. Um, an, another related point is to point out again that CSEM and MT data really are sensitive to different portions of the subsurface, or rather um, they contain complementary information about subsurface electrical resistivity. The CSEM data in panel A senses really strongly the resistive freshwater aquifer in the upper few hundred meters, but it doesn't really sense exactly where it's located in depth or how thick it is. And it sort of vaguely senses this more conductive briny feature at greater depth. The MT data is sensitive to a shallow, moderately resistive, resistive layer, and then it, that moderate resistive layer again repeats from about 200 to 400 meters depth. It senses the resistive aquifer, but doesn't know how resistive it is. And then it is quite sensitive to the briny conductive layer at greater than 400 meters depth. Then if you look at the joint posterior probability density function, it contains all of this information. So it captures all of the, the, the resolution resolving power of the CSEM data and the MT data. I guess one final interesting point to mention would be that at about 350 meters depth in the joint inversion, if you look right here, at 350 meters depth, the distribution becomes bimodal which is really pretty cool. If you look at the CSEM data, it's predicting that the resistivity is about 10 nanometers at that depth. The MT data is predicting that the resistivity is about one nanometer at that depth. And the MCMC algorithm in attempting to invert for both data sets jointly at the same time, found that a compromise value between the two just wouldn't fit the data. So it insisted that it be either one or the other. And so both peaks are present. And this is something that you simply cannot um, sort of discover with gradient-based inversion. With a deterministic method, you would end up in one local minimum or the other, but you wouldn't be savvy to the presence of the other local minimum. All right, so you have the, the posterior probability density function for electroresistivity. Um, are you done? Well, potentially, if bulk resistivity is the thing you're really interested in. But what if it's something related to bulk resistivity? say, the resistivity of the pore fluids in those sediments. If you did a gradient-based inversion, you sort of have one model estimate for the bulk resistivity, and you can make one related estimate for the pore fluid resistivity, but you can't give uncertainties on either. But with Bayesian inversion, you now have the model ensemble, which you can mine for statistical information, and you can incorporate it in a workflow to try to estimate the uncertainties in related parameters that have something to do with bulk resistivity. And I'll show you how this might work. One method of doing this is called Monte Carlo sampling. 
So I apologize for the similar moniker, um, as in Mon Markov chain Monte Carlo, but Monte Carlo sampling is much, much simpler. It's simply a process of drawing samples repeatedly from known distributions and combining them in some way to infer the range of acceptable values of some other parameter. So say I had a, a, a parameter that is a function of three or four other variables, each of which I treat as a random variable. And I have distributions, known distributions for each of them. I can draw samples from each of those distributions and compute what the value of, or the realization of my parameter of interest was, and then repeat that process many, many times and get a whole collection of estimates for my parameter of interest. Then I can generate a histogram, which again, when properly normalized, might estimate, represent an estimate of the distribution of probability for that particular parameter. So let's use this method, the Monte Carlo method, to estimate pore fluid salinity from bulk resistivity and porosity. So here we're going to use the familiar Archie's law. That simply says that the resistivity of the pore fluids is equal to the product of the bulk resistivity and the porosity raised to some exponent m that represents how well cemented sort of the, the grains in this particular sediment are. So what we wanted to do was as a function of depth for each location where we had well data in the vicinity, um, we took the MT data nearest to that well location and the CSEM data nearest to that well location and inverted them to produce model ensembles for each. And then at each depth, we sort of bend the earth into 10 meter depth intervals. And we, want, we needed essentially a distribution for bulk resistivity at each depth, a distribution for porosity at each depth, and a distribution for M, that cementation factor at each depth. And that would allow us to produce, um, through the Monte Carlo sampling method, a sort of a, a range of estimates for pore fluid resistivity at each depth, which we could then convert to salinity. So um, how do we come up with these distributions? Well, in each depth bin, each 10 meter depth bin, we asked the um, well log, what are your porosity measurements in that depth range? We averaged them and used that average as the mean of a normal distribution whose standard deviation was the standard deviation of the porosity values in the entire well log. At each depth, the, the distribution for bulk resistivity was quite simple. It's just the model ensemble. We would just sample um, at, uh, an element at random from the model ensemble and then query the resistivity um, at the midpoint of the bin for that model. And then for M, we didn't really have any field data to corroborate this. So we just assumed it was normal with a mean of two and a standard deviation of 0.2. Obviously, this is sort of the largest source of uncertainty in this process. But interestingly, this going through this process forces you to acknowledge sort of all of the parameters that provide uncertainty or contribute to the uncertainty in the thing you're interested in, in constraining in, in a way that sort of illuminates all of them. You might not have you know, thought too much about the cementation factor, but it actually is quite important. And then finally, each of the pore fluid resistivity values we converted to a salinity using um, the, the well-known conversion to uh, practical salinity units, which takes advantage of temperature or needs temperature as an input as well, which we assume to be linear. And I think the gradient we used was uh, 0 0.03 degrees Celsius per meter, I think. All right, so on the next slide, what I'm gonna show you then is the result of this. So for each of three well logs that we had, and for each of three model ensembles, CSEM only, MT only, and joint, I'll be showing you sort of marginal distributions of, per, of uh, sorry, salinity as a function of depth in these 10 meter um, depth intervals. So here it is. And again, I apologize for the busy slide. There's a lot going on. Um, from left to right in the columns are the three model ensembles, CSEM, MT, and joint. From top in the rows are the three wells, M27, M28, and M29. The warm colors, again, represent regions of higher probability density. The cooler colors are regions of lower probability density. On each plot, the y-axis is, again, depth in meters. And sorry, yeah, the y-axis is depth in meters. The x-axis now is practical salinity units. From um, more saline on the left, so more fresh on the left to more saline on the right. The dashed magenta line on each plot is the actual well log, the measured salinities from the well log. 
a number of takeaway points from here. One is that we seem to be doing a relatively good job of the high regions of high probability density matching up pretty well with where the measured salinities um, came in from the well. I will admit that part of that matchup and part of the, I guess, part of the high resolution component of that matchup certainly comes from the high resolution nature of the actual you know, well data, which is much higher resolution than a diffusive method like uh, CSCM or MT. But still, it was sort of satisfying, especially given that the measured salinities in no way informed, um, the, act, the actual measured data in no way informed the estimate of probability density that I'm showing you here neither through the Bayesian version nor through the Monte Carlo method. So these are you know, estimates coming from totally different sources of data and they're matching up quite nicely. And also the joint inversion seems to do better than either of the two independent inversions. And again, that doesn't surprise me and sh shouldn't surprise anyone because you're again, from the lens of information theory, CSEM and MT are providing different information. And so when you add those two together, you're just going to be able to constrain the subsurface um, more completely. And again, this is just an example of one of the many ways in which the posterior model ensemble is very, very powerful and it allows you to sort of mine it for all kinds of statistical information um, to try to tease out or constrain um, subsurface parameters. All right, to conclude, Bayesian inversion, in this case MCMC, produces not one model, but a whole ensemble of models from which statistical information about your model parameters can be derived. Um, I hope I've convinced you that Bayesian inversion allows us to visualize in a pretty cool way the resolution gain of jointly inverting multiple data sets. And finally, the most important point of all, the posterior model ensemble really is a powerful tool uh, that can be used to make quantitative estimates of uncertainty on related parameters, not just bulk resistivity, for example, pore fluid salinity. And with that, I'll uh, thank you for your attention and be happy to take your questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Daniel. I've got a couple of questions that have come through on the chat. Sure. Let me just find them. Okay, so the first one from Graham Beardsmore. For the joint inversion of real data, did you invert only for resistivities or also for depths of boundaries? That's a great question. So we did both at the same time. So the, the MCMC algorithm is transdimensional in the sense that you sort of let the data guide how many model parameters you need. And it, with our 1D model, um, that includes sort of interface depths, interface locations, I should say, in depth, and also layer resistivities. So it's, it's simultaneous inverting for the, the subsurface resistivity, the layer resistivities, but also um, where those interface boundaries should be and how many of them there should be. So when I showed you the plots of posterior probability density as a function of depth, that was all binned. So basically in order to make those plots, you have to go through and say, you know, within this depth bin, what is the resistivity of each model in the ensemble and then go down to the next depth bin and so on and so forth. Um, but actually each of the models in the ensemble has a different number of layers um, in, in, in addition to having different resistivities for the layers. Thanks. Uh, the next question, why do you classify MCMC as a fancy method? <laughs> well, it's fancy relative to Monte Carlo sampling in the sense that in order to draw samples from the distribution, um, you need sort of this more machinery because you don't actually have a closed form analytical you know, expression for your distribution. You, don't, you can't write down the posterior distribution um, on pen and paper. But with Monte Carlo sampling, you have to be able to, or you can't actually um, draw samples from those distributions. But it's actually a, quite a simple method. In, once you understand how it works, it's not doing anything actually that fancy. Great. Um, from David Annette's great talk, Daniel, in your joint inversion, did you use E and B data from both data sets? Uh, this question has a few parts, so I might need to repeat some of it to you, but did you use E and B data from both data sets? Could you comment on data scaling? I would imagine very different data ranges. Does one data set dominate? Great questions. Um, for the controlled source electromagnetic, we only used the inline component of the electric field. We always meant to use um, also the E and B data 
that was collected on the ocean bottom receivers, um, but we never actually got around to doing that. Um, sort of the nature of a, being a PhD student, you always have to move on to the next project. So yeah, just the inline electric field for the CSEM. We use both ENB field data for the magnetotelluric data. Um, data scaling is a very interesting question. I sort of initially approached this project assuming that in joint Bayesian inversion, you'd have to sort of weight the two data sets off against each other. Instead, what I came around to is that you really can't do that in the Bayesian framework. You just have to make sure that you estimated your data errors properly. Um, and yeah, that, that is, it is sort of a difficult um, question. You can actually, in Bayesian inversion, there's a method of inverting also for the value of a scaling factor that scales um, the data sets to try to get the data errors right. Um, but we instead just use what's called a, a maximum likelihood estimator of, of that for each data set. So there is some sort of crude scaling going on. Um, but yeah, mostly you just let sort of the, the the fits to the data sort of talk and the, let, let the information provided by each of the data sets sort of express itself. And in this case, the MT and CSEM data are, it contain such different information about the subsurface that I didn't see one sort of dominating the other. So they sort of needed each other. But I could definitely see other instances where um, adding a new data set really doesn't affect the results too much because it's not contributing much unique information. Great, I think you got all the parts there, well done. <laughs> um, from Wenping, um, thanks Daniel. When sampling, do you take the models with less layers, the concept of minimum structure? That's a great question. Bayesian inversion has, Bayes' rule has an implicit preference for simpler models, actually. It's called Bayesian parsimony. And I didn't, I thought it was a little bit too much math to sort of go through that, but um, it's easy, relatively easy to show why this is the case. But yeah, so basically all things equal, if two particular models fit the data just as well, then the Bayesian inversion prefers the one that has fewer model parameters. So that's why, so, so I, actually, if you looked at the number of model parameters, a histogram of number of model parameters, you would see it was biased towards the low end. And another part to that question, do you need to calculate depth of interest to constrain maximum model depth? So also from Wenping. Uh, depth of interest. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, there's actually a really cool way to do this in a statistical sense. I sort of stopped including them in my plots just because it, it's, it's never really like that useful. At least I haven't found it that useful. I'm sure in, in more in a prospecting uh, environment, it actually might be quite useful. Um, typically, in a gradient-based setting, depth of investigation or depth of interest is sort of determined usually through some sort of um, Jacobian matrix. Um, but that sort of has the difficulty that you have to sort of pick an arbitrary cutoff uh, of, of what you think is, is acceptable. Whereas from a statistical perspective, what you're really talking about is information contribution of the data. So where does my posterior look different than my prior? And basically, you know that your, the data is going to be less and less informative as a function of depth. And so you basically want to have a measure of where my posterior starts to look like my prior again in depth. Like where in depth does that happen? And um, the short answer is it's basically where your fifth and 95th percentiles reach the edge of your uniform prior distribution. But there's actually another way of calculating it from a statistical standpoint, which is called the kullback leibler divergence. It's just a, a measure of how different two statistical distributions are from each other. So if you measure the, how different or the distance in a metric sense between the posterior and the prior, that gives you essentially a, a measure of how much information your data is contributing to your model parameters. And at some point in depth, the kullback leibler divergence will sort of just asymptote to zero, in which case um, the posterior is equal to the prior and the data is no longer contributing anything and you shouldn't trust you know, your, your model parameters at that point. Great, next question from Janelle Simpson. Thanks for the talk, Daniel. What is involved in estimating your data errors properly? How do you confirm that you have estimated them appropriately? This is a very good question. And it's one of those questions that you sort of like, even after you've been really careful, you still wonder. Um, well, first of all, you need to know a lot about your data. You need to know sort of the, the, the error floor on the instrument and you need to know um, 
as you're doing data stacking and all sorts of other things, as you're doing your data processing, which you go basically from the raw data to sort of your process data, you need to know at every step in that workflow what, what you think the, the data error estimates really should be. Um, one sort of useful tool you can use from an, in a Bayesian sense is that once you've obtained your model ensemble, each model has a misfit associated with it. And you can plot, therefore, a histogram of all the misfits across every model in the ensemble. And uh, ideally, you want that to be around RMS1. Um, you want that to be sort of chi-squared distributed with a peak at RMS1. And if it's not, that's probably a sign that you um, haven't estimated your data errors correctly. Um, another method you can use in a Bayesian inversion framework is what's called hierarchical Bayesian inversion, where you basically, in addition to inverting for your layer depths and your layer resistivities, you also you scale um, your data set. You can either scale each individual data point, or you can just scale the data set as a whole, and you invert for those scaling factors too. And that allows the data to sort of select its own ideal um, uh, data error. Um, there's a number of ways of doing this, and sort of the jury is still out actually as to what the best method is, but I don't think anything substitutes for just having a really good idea of your data processing workflow and what um, in a reasonable sense, um, your data error ought to be. But yeah, there's no real solid answer to that question. Sorry. So kind of along the same lines from Yusin, great talk, thanks. Knowing what the true noise levels are is really hard with real data. Any thoughts around this? Yeah. I mean, I guess um, my answer to the previous question sort of applies to this one as well. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very big question. I think there are some, some of the things I mentioned, some of the unique features of Bayesian inversion can help with that, but it's, it's not an easy, there's no silver bullet, I guess, is, is my, my takeaway. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I can't see any more questions on the chat. Did anyone else have any more questions or um, you can use the raise hand feature if you wanted to ask um, anything uh, verbally? Um, doesn't look like anyone's done that. Um, actually, just in the, okay, there is two questions pop up. One is, could you please share your slides? So I should have mentioned this at the start. Dan has agreed to make this available on our ASCG YouTube channel. Um, Dan, did you want to comment on whether you'd be willing to share your slides? Um, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, no problem at all. Yeah, so um, perhaps I can just provide when ping with your email address to follow that up. Um, also from David Annette's uh, thoughts on extension to 2 plus D. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's definitely where I've, uh, I've spent the last like year and a half of my PhD working on a 2D Bayesian inversion algorithm for MT data. Um, that algorithm is now it works on real data now, and I'm actually um, writing up a, a paper on that that should be published in the next couple of months. It will be part of my dissertation. It's work that I've been I'm working on with uh, Nanda Rup Ray at Geoscience Australia. So if you know him, you can ping him. Um, he knows um, you know as much or more about this than I do. But yes, we we actually have successfully produced a 2D Bayesian inversion algorithm for MT data. The problem with scaling up um, to 2D and and more dimensions, 3D even is just the computational cost. And that's sort of what we've been working on bringing down. And we've succeeded for MT, and the sort of the next target, of course, is um, CSEM. Great, thanks. Um, I think that wraps up the questions. Um, lots of other comments. Thank you for a great talk, which I will agree with. Fantastic talk. And I'm sure everyone would join me in wishing you luck finishing off your PhD. Um, I noticed that Millicent Crow has put in the links to our social media and YouTube. So uh, that they're in the chat if you haven't subscribed. And so, as I mentioned, Daniel's talk will be up on the YouTube channel. Um, so with that, um, it's definitely it's getting late in America where Daniel's presenting from. So perhaps we'll let him go and give him a virtual round of applause. So thanks, Dan. And thanks everyone for joining.